Chapter Eight, Part One of Queen Victoria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Queen Victoria by Giles Lytton Strachey. Chapter Eight Gladstone and Lord Beaconsfield. One. Lord Palmerston's laugh, a queer metallic ha, 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 with reverberations in it from the days of Pitt and the Congress of Vienna, was heard no more in Piccadilly. Lord John Russell dwindled into senility. Lord Derby tottered from the stage. A new scene opened, and new protagonists, Mr. Gladstone and Mr. Disraeli, struggled together in the limelight. Victoria, from her post of vantage, watched these developments with that passionate and personal interest which she invariably imported into politics. Her prepossessions were of an unexpected kind. Mr. Gladstone had been the disciple of her revered Peel, and had won the approval of Albert. Mr. Disraeli had hounded Sir Robert to his fall with hideous virulence, and the Prince had pronounced that he had not one single element of a gentleman in his composition. Yet she regarded Mr. Gladstone with a distrust and dislike which steadily deepened, while upon his rival she lavished an abundance of confidence, esteem, and affection such as Lord Melbourne himself had hardly known. Her attitude towards the Tory minister had suddenly changed when she found that he alone, among public men, had divined her feelings at Albert's death. Of the others she might have said, "'They pity me!' and not my grief. But Mr. Disraeli had understood, and all his condolences had taken the form of reverential eulogies of the departed. The Queen declared that he was the only person who appreciated the Prince. She began to show him special favor, gave him and his wife two of the coveted seats in St. George's Chapel at the Prince of Wales's wedding, and invited him to stay a night at Windsor. When the grant for the Albert Memorial came before the House of Commons, Disraeli, as a leader of the opposition, eloquently supported the project. He was rewarded by a copy of the Prince's speeches, bound in white Morocco, with an inscription in the royal hand. In his letter of thanks, he ventured to touch upon a sacred theme, and, in a strain which re-echoed with masterly fidelity the sentiments of his correspondent, dwelt at length upon the absolute perfection of Albert. The Prince, he said, is the only person whom Mr. Disraeli has ever known who realized the ideal. None with whom he is acquainted have ever approached it. There was in him a union of the manly grace and sublime simplicity of chivalry with the intellectual splendor of the Attic Academe. The only character in English history that would, in some respects, draw near to him is Sir Philip Sidney. The same high tone, the same universal accomplishments, the same blended tenderness and vigor, the same rare combination of romantic energy and classic repose. As for his own acquaintance with the Prince, it had been, he said, one of the most satisfactory incidents of his life, full of refined and beautiful memories, and exercising, as he hopes, over his remaining existence, a soothing and exalting influence. Victoria was much affected by the depth and delicacy of these touches, and henceforward Disraeli's place in her affections was assured. When, in 1866, the Conservatives came into office, Disraeli's position as Chancellor of the Exchequer and Leader of the House necessarily brought him into a closer relationship with the Sovereign. Two years later, Lord Derby resigned, and Victoria, with intense delight and peculiar graciousness, welcomed Disraeli as her first minister. But only for nine agitated months did he remain in power. The ministry, in a minority in the Commons, was swept out of existence by a general election. Yet by the end of that short period, the ties which bound together the Queen and her Premier had grown far stronger than ever before. The relationship between them was now no longer merely that between a grateful mistress and a devoted servant. 
they were friends his official letters in which the personal element had always been perceptible developed into racy records of political news and social gossip written as lord clarendon said in his best novel style victoria was delighted she had never she declared had such letters in her life and had never before known everything in return she sent him when the spring came several bunches of flowers picked by her own hands he dispatched to her a set of his novels for which she said she was most grateful and which she values much she herself had lately published her leaves from the journal of our life in the highlands and it was observed that the prime minister in conversing with her majesty at this period constantly used the words we authors ma'am upon political questions she was his staunch supporter really there never was such conduct as that of the opposition she wrote and when the government was defeated in the house she was really shocked at the way in which the house of commons go on they really bring discredit on constitutional government she dreaded the prospect of a change she feared that if the liberals insisted upon disestablishing the irish church her coronation oath might stand in the way but a change there had to be and victoria vainly tried to console herself for the loss of her favorite minister by bestowing a peerage upon mrs disraeli mr gladstone was in his shirt-sleeves at harden cutting down a tree when the royal message was brought to him very significant he remarked when he had read the letter and went on cutting down his tree his secret thoughts on the occasion were more explicit and were committed to his diary the almighty he wrote seems to sustain and spare me for some purpose of his own deeply unworthy as i know myself to be glory be to his name the queen however did not share her new minister's view of the almighty's intentions she could not believe that there was any divine purpose to be detected in the program of sweeping changes which mr gladstone was determined to carry out but what could she do mr gladstone with his demonic energy and his powerful majority in the house of commons was irresistible and for five years, 1869 to 74, Victoria found herself condemned to live in an agitating atmosphere of interminable reform. Reform in the Irish church and the Irish land system, reform in education, reform in parliamentary elections, reform in the organization of the army and the navy, reform in the administration of justice. She disapproved, she struggled, she grew very angry she felt that if albert had been living things would never have happened so but her protests and her complaints were alike unavailing the mere effort of grappling with the mass of documents which poured in upon her in an ever-growing flood was terribly exhausting when the draft of the lengthy and intricate irish church bill came before her accompanied by an explanatory letter from mr gladstone covering a dozen closely written quarto pages she almost despaired she turned from the bill to the explanation and from the explanation back again to the bill and she could not decide which was the most confusing but she had to do her duty she had not only to read but to make notes at last she handed the whole heap of papers to mr martin who happened to be staying at osborne and requested him to make a precis of them when he had done so her disapproval of the measure became more marked than ever but such was the strength of the government she actually found herself obliged to urge moderation upon the opposition lest worse should ensue in the midst of this crisis when the future of the irish church was hanging in the balance victoria's attention was drawn to another proposed reform it was suggested that the sailors in the navy should henceforward be allowed to wear beards has mr childers ascertained anything on the subject of the beards the queen wrote anxiously to the first lord of the admiralty on the whole her majesty was in favor of the change her own personal feeling she wrote 
would be for the beards without the moustaches, as the latter have rather a soldier-like appearance. But then the object in view would not be obtained, that is to say, to prevent the necessity of shaving. Therefore it had better be as proposed, the entire beard, only it should be kept short and very clean. After thinking over the question for another week, the Queen wrote a final letter. She wished, she said, to make one additional observation respecting the beards, that is to say, that on no account should moustaches be allowed without beards. That must be clearly understood. Changes in the navy might be tolerated. To lay hands upon the army was a more serious matter. From time immemorial there had been a particularly close connection between the army and the crown and Albert had devoted even more time and attention to the details of military business than to the processes of fresco painting or the planning of sanitary cottages for the deserving poor. But now there was to be a great alteration. Mr. Gladstone's fiat had gone forth, and the commander-in-chief was to be removed from his direct dependence upon the sovereign and made subordinate to Parliament and the Secretary of State for War. Of all the liberal reforms, this was the one which aroused the bitterest resentment in Victoria. She considered that the change was an attack upon her personal position, almost an attack upon the personal position of Albert. But she was helpless, and the Prime Minister had his way. When she heard that the dreadful man had yet another reform in contemplation, that he was about to abolish the purchase of military commissions, she could only feel that it was just what might have been expected. For a moment she hoped that the House of Lords would come to the rescue. The peers opposed the change with unexpected vigor, but Mr. Gladstone, more conscious than ever of the support of the Almighty, was ready with an ingenious device. The purchase of commissions had been originally allowed by royal warrant. It should now be disallowed by the same agency. Victoria was faced by a curious dilemma. She abominated the abolition of purchase, but she was asked to abolish it by an exercise of sovereign power which was very much to her taste. She did not hesitate for long, and when the cabinet in a formal minute advised her to sign the warrant, she did so with a good grace. Unacceptable as Mr. Gladstone's policy was, there was something else about him which was even more displeasing to Victoria. She disliked his personal demeanor towards herself. It was not that Mr. Gladstone, in his intercourse with her, was in any degree lacking in courtesy or respect. On the contrary, an extraordinary reverence impregnated his manner, both in his conversation and his correspondence with the sovereign. Indeed, with that deep and passionate conservatism which to the very end of his incredible career gave such an unexpected colouring to his inexplicable character, Mr. Gladstone viewed Victoria through a haze of awe which was almost religious, as a sacrosanct embodiment of venerable traditions, a vital element in the British Constitution, a queen by act of Parliament but unfortunately the lady did not appreciate the compliment. The well-known complaint, He speaks to me as if I were a public meeting, whether authentic or no, and the turn of the sentence is surely a little too epigrammatic to be genuinely Victorian, undoubtedly expresses the essential element of her antipathy. She had no objection to being considered as an institution. She was one, and she knew it. But she was a woman, too, and to be considered only as an institution, that was unbearable. And thus all Mr. Gladstone's zeal and devotion, his ceremonious phrases, his low bows, his punctilious correctitudes, were utterly wasted. And when in the excess of his loyalty he went further and imputed to the object of his veneration with obsequious blindness, the subtlety of intellect, the wide reading, the grave enthusiasm which he himself possessed, the misunderstanding became complete. The discordance between the actual Victoria and this strange divinity made in Mr. Gladstone's image produced disastrous results. Her discomfort and dislike turned at last into positive animosity, and though her manners continued to be perfect, she never for a moment unbent, 
while he on his side was overcome with disappointment, perplexity, and mortification. Yet his fidelity remained unshaken. When the cabinet met, the Prime Minister, filled with his beatific vision, would open the proceedings by reading aloud the letters which he had received from the Queen upon the questions of the hour. The assembly sat in absolute silence, while one after another the royal missives, with their emphases, their ejaculations, and their grammatical peculiarities, boomed forth in all the deep solemnity of Mr. Gladstone's utterance not a single comment of any kind was ever hazarded and after a fitting pause the cabinet proceeded with the business of the day two little as victoria appreciated her prime minister's attitude towards her she found that it had its uses the popular discontent at her uninterrupted seclusion had been gathering force for many years and now burst out in a new and alarming shape Republicanism was in the air. Radical opinion in England, stimulated by the fall of Napoleon III and the establishment of a republican government in France, suddenly grew more extreme than it ever had been since 1848. It also became, for the first time, almost respectable. Chartism had been entirely an affair of the lower classes, but now members of Parliament, learned professors, and ladies of title openly avowed the most subversive views. The monarchy was attacked both in theory and in practice, and it was attacked at a vital point. It was declared to be too expensive. What benefits, it was asked, did the nation reap to counterbalance the enormous sums which were expended upon the sovereign? Victoria's retirement gave an unpleasant handle to the argument, it was pointed out that the ceremonial functions of the crown had virtually lapsed, and the awkward question remained whether any of the other functions, which it did continue to perform, were really worth £385,000 per annum. The royal balance sheet was curiously examined. An anonymous pamphlet entitled, What Does She Do With It?, appeared, setting forth the financial position with malicious clarity. The Queen, it stated, was granted by the civil list sixty thousand pounds a year for her private use, but the rest of her vast annuity was given, as the Act declared, to enable her to defray the expenses of her royal household and to support the honour and dignity of the Crown. Now it was obvious that, since the death of the Prince, the expenditure for both these purposes must have been very considerably diminished and it was difficult to resist the conclusion that a large sum of money was diverted annually from the uses for which it had been designed by Parliament to swell the private fortune of Victoria. The precise amount of that private fortune it was impossible to discover, but there was reason to suppose that it was gigantic. Perhaps it reached a total of five million pounds. The pamphlet protested against such a state of affairs, and its protests were repeated vigorously in newspapers and at public meetings. Though it is certain that the estimate of Victoria's riches was much exaggerated, it is equally certain that she was an exceedingly wealthy woman. She probably saved twenty thousand pounds a year from the civil list. The revenues of the Duchy of Lancaster were steadily increasing. She had inherited a considerable property from the Prince Consort and she had been left in 1852 an estate of half a million by Mr. John Nild, an eccentric miser. In these circumstances it was not surprising that when in 1871 Parliament was asked to vote a dowry of £30,000 to the Princess Louise on her marriage with the eldest son of the Duke of Argyle, together with an annuity of £6,000, there should have been a serious outcry. Note. In 1889 it was officially stated that the Queen's total savings from the civil list amounted to £824,025, but that out of this sum much had been spent on special entertainments to foreign visitors. Taking into consideration the proceeds from the Duchy of Lancaster, which were more than £60,000 a year, the savings of the Prince Consort and Mr. Nild's legacy, it seems probable that, at the time of her death, Victoria's private fortune approached two million pounds. 
End of note. In order to conciliate public opinion, the Queen opened Parliament in person, and the vote was passed almost unanimously. But a few months later another demand was made. The Prince Arthur had come of age, and the nation was asked to grant him an annuity of fifteen thousand pounds. The outcry was redoubled. The newspapers were filled with angry articles. Bradlaugh thundered against princely paupers to one of the largest crowds that had ever been seen in Trafalgar Square, and Sir Charles Dilke expounded the case for a republic in a speech to his constituents at Newcastle. The Prince's annuity was ultimately sanctioned in the House of Commons by a large majority, but a minority of fifty members voted in favour of reducing the sum to ten thousand pounds. Towards every aspect of this distasteful question Mr. Gladstone presented an iron front. He absolutely discountenanced the extreme section of his followers. He declared that the whole of the Queen's income was justly at her personal disposal, argued that to complain of royal savings was merely to encourage royal extravagance, and successfully convoyed through Parliament the unpopular annuities which, he pointed out, were strictly in accordance with precedent. When, in 1872, Sir Charles Dilke once more returned to the charge in the House of Commons, introducing a motion for a full inquiry into the Queen's expenditure with a view to a root-and-branch reform of the civil list, the Prime Minister brought all the resources of his powerful and ingenious eloquence to the support of the Crown. He was completely successful, and amid a scene of great disorder the motion was ignominiously dismissed. Victoria was relieved, but she grew no fonder of Mr. Gladstone. It was, perhaps, the most miserable moment of her life. The ministers, the press, the public, all conspired to vex her, to blame her, to misinterpret her actions, to be unsympathetic and disrespectful in every way. She was a cruelly misunderstood woman, she told Mr. Martin, complaining to him bitterly of the unjust attacks which were made upon her, and declaring that the great worry and anxiety and hard work for ten years, alone, unaided, with increasing age and never very strong health, were breaking her down, and almost drove her to despair. The situation was indeed deplorable. It seemed as if her whole existence had gone awry, as if an irremediable antagonism had grown up between the Queen and the nation. If Victoria had died in the early seventies, there can be little doubt that the voice of the world would have pronounced her a failure. End of chapter 8, part 2